end up producing its own energy. So it's going to build up these magnetic lines and fluxes when you remove the charge and those lines of magnetic flux fluxes and it induces a voltage. Unlike a capacitor where it stores, uh, stores energy, you know, we're going to put in, put in our power supply and we charge up our capacitor and then we remove the power supply and the capacitor holds that charge. Well, inductor just does it, induces its movement by the flashing of the magnetic fields. So, so our symbol for uh, for an inductor. So some of the things that make up, uh, you know, what makes up an inductor, you can have different cores, the number of turns, uh, the length of the the length of the inductor, the cross-sectional area. And then there's actually a little formula here that actually uh, So if you want to know what your inductance is, it's equal to the number of turns squared by the area, I think it is. Oh, permeability. And the permeability you're gonna find out when you read your when you do chapter chapter seven. And then divide by your length. Okay, so it's our number of turns, how many, how many coils do we have going around it, our permeability of our core, that's just uh, how well does it uh, accept the magnetic fields or the magnetic flux and stuff going through that thing, that just kind of promotes it, helps, uh, helps induce our magnetic field going across our wires, and then our square area of our, of our core material, and then the length of the coil along it. And then, it, and then that's what determines our inductance. Every once in a while, you'll, you might, you know, down the road, you might have to dig out your textbook or go out on the internet and take a look. You might have to make your own inductor. You know, and we can just take a piece of wire, wrap it around our, around the pencil, and make an inductor, and we can actually come up with a, you know, somewhat of a crude calculations uh, to come up with a, an accurate. Uh, inductor that we can use in our circuit. Typically, you can just go ahead and buy them. You know, they're just uh, here's a you know just a little adjustable one. You see those all the time on the on the little circuit boards, but this is a little adjustable one. Pass that around. Have to grab another one. But uh, some of our other ones that uh, that we have in our kit. Sometimes you can see the windings, or otherwise, sometimes they're encapsulated in a little uh, blue case. Those were one of the more common ones. Staying on the sides of them, sometimes they're just little coils. They look almost just like this, except then they're epoxy covered and stuff. And those are uh, and those are our inductors. So, so sometimes that formula comes in handy. You know, you won't need it for on any of your quizzes or tests or anything like that. It's just. Uh, a nice to know formula though if you did end up having to make one. So how can I increase or decrease my inductor and stuff like that if I wanted to make one particular for our circuit? I'm trying to think on uh, when we get into solid state labs, when we get into solid state, there's a lab where we're making an oscillator and we actually make a make an inductor, but they tell you exactly how many coils, how many wraps to make and how long to make which the inductor and stuff like that, and we make our own, uh, like, a, like a two micro Henry uh, inductor there. So, so the, so we have our, so and that's our inductance, and then our, and our units is, uh, is going to be H. And so typically it, it's going to be for Henry's, that's going to be our units, so it's either going to be, you know, micro Henry's, milli Henry's, or Henry's. Those are the three main common ones. So it's either micro mini, micro milli, or actual Henry's. Um, I don't think I've ever ran across a Pico Henry, but I suppose there could be a case out there that could be. But typically they're going to be micro milli or Henry's. Um, So the other thing that we have then is our um, 
So there's a couple of things that uh, that we have to be aware of when we're when we're working with um, inductors is that we got this long, you know, we could have several hundred wraps going around our core and stuff. And as I increase the length of my wire, that wire is actually going to have some resistance. We don't have anything that right now that's available on the market where we don't have zero resistance on our wire. Our wire always has some type of resistance. If we didn't have any resistance in our wire, then that's what we call, and you'll, you've heard the term, uh, superconductor. But we don't have anything available to us yet that allows us to have a superconductor. So all our wire that we wrap these inductors around, and as we increase the length of it, we keep on adding resistance to it. And that resistance becomes part of our circuit. It's an unwanted thing that we don't want to have. It changes the quality of our inductor, but we have to deal with it anyways. And that's our uh, that's our resistance of the uh, resistance of our windings. And then so it gets brought into being put in series with our inductor. So then basically what we end up with is when we get into chapter 12, we got a. We got an R RL circuit right here, just alone, just with the coil itself. Chapter 11 or chapter 12, we're going to just kind of ignore the resistance of the winding. It's negligible for our circuits in that, uh, for most of our circuits when we're just doing an RL circuit. But when we get into chapter 13, then we're going to reintroduce that resistance of the winding again, and we're going to enter it into our calculations for our um, RLC circuit, our resistor, inductor, and our capacitor. Uh, circuit. But typically a lot of times it can just be ignored. It's insignificant. So then the other thing, and we kind of talked about this the other day when we were trying to talk about measuring capacitors, is that we can have what we call that straight capacitance. And remember when we were talking about measuring our uh, measuring our capacitors, I said we want to keep those lead lengths short and stuff. If we have two pieces of wire You know, side by side, we kind of formed ourselves, uh, formed ourselves a capacitance. You know, we have this inductor that's inside there, and then we have our insulation of our wire, and then we have the air gap, and then insulation, and then another conductor and stuff. And we formed, uh, formed our capacitance in there. And that can be our, and that's our straight capacitance. Again, something that we don't want, but since we're wrapping wire around uh, that inductor and stuff, we form that straight capacitance, and then that straight capacitance becomes in parallel with our resistance of our winding and our inductor. So that can be, uh, so that can be, uh, you know, that can be a, that can be a problem for our circuit too. So if we have a lot of straight capacitance, and we know that my capacitance reactance is equal to 1 over 2 pi Fc, if I have a, if I have a, if I have something with a very low capacitor reactance, and I don't change the value of that straight capacitance, that means I'm going to have, you know, anything with very high frequency going through this circuit. If I have something that's very high, high frequency going through this circuit, my capacitive reactance is going to drop, and then that means that all my current then is just going to go right up and go right around my inductor. It's not even going to see my inductor and my resistance of the winding. So we only have to worry about this when it becomes very high frequencies. So if we're dealing with something very high frequency, my FCC is going to drop, and then all my current is just going to go right around my inductor and it's not even going to see it. So we have to be careful of that in those cases. I don't think in my anytime working out there, I don't think I've ever had to worry about the straight capacitance of, of an inductor, but it is out there. And again, I always like to use my formulas, you know, just kind of, so how do I analyze it? You know, what would happen to this circuit? And I always kind of go back to using all my formulas. Those are just some good formulas that we use for our troubleshooting and understand how that stuff works. Okay, so we had straight capacitance that we have to worry about, and then the resistance of the winding. The resistance of the winding we will, we will deal with when we get into chapter 13. All right, any questions? Uh, so far, pretty straightforward. There isn't really much to chapter 11, I'll tell you. All right. 
let's uh, start taking a look at how, how an inductor works. So if I have a, again, it's, it's kind of, now you're going to do this and you get into, when you're doing your chapter 7 on your independent lab there. But if I bring a magnetic, uh, if I bring a uh, magnet and I run it through a coil of wire, as I bring that magnet through that coil of wire, it's going to induce a voltage. And that's our Lenz's law there. They talk about how we can induce a voltage by running a magnet. We've taken all these, we've got these lines of magnetic fluxes, and as we run that magnet through those lines of magnetic fluxes, cut across the, the wire, and as, it, as the lines of magnetic flux, fluxes cross those wires, it's going to induce a voltage. It starts giving those electrons clarity, and then they start flowing in your circuit. So that's our, uh, or not, uh, not Lenz's law, but uh, Faraday's law there. So that's kind of how an inductor works. Instead, what we're doing is we're going to, we're kind of going to be using it. We're going to induce a voltage into it. It's going to build up the lines of magnetic fluxes. We shut the power off, and the lines of magnetic fluxes cross those wires and induce a voltage. Uh, so here's uh, here's one that we're going to take a look at. Each other out. 
because it's inducing its own voltage, creating its own current. And this current's trying to go this way, and the voltage and the current that it's trying to develop is going this way, and it's got that opposition to current. So when I first apply my 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 voltage to it, I'm going to have a very high, you know, we can call it kind of our high X of L, okay? It's going to be very high resistance. It's going to take, if I don't have a, since it's going to have a very, it's going to have a greater opposition to current, and that's our definition for resistance, right? So if I have a high opposition to current, I'm going to have a very high X of L. It's going to be very high on there. And so then that's, if I had an RLC circuit, or like an RL circuit like this piece here, the voltage would be all being dropped across the inductor and nothing across the resistor. If I kept the power on, then the opposite is going to happen. Then eventually, the inductor is going to act like a short, and then the resistor is going to take all the voltage. So that's what they're kind of trying to demonstrate here is that, okay, they apply the voltage, the lines of magnetic pluses are starting to build up. My current is going to kind of just remain constant, okay? Unlike a, unlike a capacitor where my current is going to, you know, my capacitor, my capacitor, my current is going to be starting out very high over time. My current's going to be very high, and then it's going to act like a short, and my current's going to drop. When I do it with an inductor, when I do it with an inductor, it's going to have that total opposition to the current, and the current is going to start out very low, and then go to very high. to its maximum. So an inductor acts like an open when I first apply voltage to it, and then it acts like a short after a certain amount of time, and then a capacitor acts like a short, and then acts like an open. Okay, so like I said, these things are just going to be, the two are just opposite of one another. So then I go ahead and I, I go ahead and I, I go ahead and I close that switch, and now what happens to my resistance on my parallel circuit? Does that increase or decrease? As I add another resistor to a circuit in parallel, what happens to my total resistance of that parallel circuit? Does it go up or go down? It goes down. The resistance goes down, and then my my current is going to increase. And as that current increases again, then what happens is as that it starts to develop a few more lines of magnetic flux, I end up having another change in the magnetic field. Again, it's going to try to oppose the current going into it. And so it's, so it would kind of take a little dip first, and then it just kind of go back up, and then it's going to remain constant again. So it's going to kind of dip down, and then that current is going to build back up again. Once the line, magnetic lines of flux is expand out as far as they can, depending on the current going through there, then it's going to kind of stabilize out, and then it's just going to have that current going through there. It's not going to have the opposition to current anymore, and then the current is just increased because of the parallel resistors there. So I increase my current, my total current of my circuit. Again, this has nothing to do with my current going through my circuit, other than the resistance of the windings, but that's negligible for what we're talking about. Okay. So now I go into my next step, and then they open up the switch. Now I remove that. Now I remove that resistor, and now my total current goes down. And then what happens is that then my lines of magnetic fluxes close, and it induces a voltage back into the circuit, and then it's just going to stabilize back out again. It's going to induce that induce that current and then stabilize back out again. Once, that, once the lines of magnetic flux is collapsed, has the opposition to current, and then it stabilizes back out. But the big thing here is just kind of, you know, remembering that, you know, that inductor is going to act like a, act like an open when it first applies voltage, and then it's going to act like a short. 
So the inductors are a little bit, you know, capacitors are a little bit more straightforward, but the inductors are, you know, they're, they're a little bit more complicated. It's, it's kind of harder to see that and how that's working with the magnetic lines of flux is collapsing and stuff like that. Where I think the capacitors are a lot more straightforward. But you just always remember capacitors block DC, allow AC, inductors allow DC, block AC. Uh, Capacitor acts like a short when first applied, voltage applied to it, and then acts like an open. Inductor acts like an open, and then acts like a short after time. So you can kind of remember those rules of thumbs, then you can always understand how an inductor works. All right, any questions on that? Does that kind of make a little sense there? Just remember the general rules. I mean, that's that's the big thing. And then you can kind of analyze any circuit. You just kind of remember the general characteristics of these things. Um, so we got the fixed and the variable. So I kind of passed around the fixed one, which is in the one that's in the blue case. And then the variable one where you see like on radios and stuff like that for where we want to tweak in certain frequencies. Um, so we have either both uh, fixed or variable, just like capacitors, we can have either fixed or variable ones on capacitors. Uh, we can have different types of cores. We can have uh, air core, iron core, or uh, a laminated core. Um, So here's a, here's what would be a so I'll pass it on. This is what's a laminated core or an inductor. An air core would be just if I took a piece of wire, wrapped it around my pencil, and then removed my pencil, that would be the that would be the air core one. Again, you're not gonna, you know, at that point you're not gonna probably build anything with a, with a laminated core or iron core or anything like that. Plus but an air core, though, we, we might build our own <coughs> air core conductor. What are you guys saying? The uh, laminated core, those are usually used for a lot more heavy duty things. Yeah. Yeah, but it depends on, you know, if you want, how you want to you know, increase your inductance and your permeability. Is that, as I, you know, if I put a laminated core in, uh, for my inductor, I'm going to increase my inductance of it. Because I have a, a path for my magnetic fields to flow through and it enhances my magnetic fields. But again, you know, we don't need to get into too much of the characteristics of uh, of an inductor and stuff, other than we know that a piece of wire can be either wrapped around an air core, iron core, or some kind of a uh, steel core. So these are the different types. The ones I passed around was one like uh, that looks like the blue canister, and then the variable one that's in that steel canister. But otherwise, they come, some of them look like uh, resistors. Here's the ones that are saying you can see the actual wires on these, and then they're uh, covered with epoxy. Uh, they can just be exposed ones. Are there color codes on these inductors, or is that just Yeah, there is. Uh, these ones have a color code, but again, I'm not going to make you kind of like uh, bastards. Just keep them in the bag, and you don't have to. But like on those, the other ones, like. Um, They'll have, like on those blue ones, they'll have ones that have, you know, 333. And so, again, the, you know, the first two digits are going to be a three, and then the three, and then three more zeros after that. And then you, like, uh, this line here, I know it's going to be a 33. Uh, I think um, I'd have to think back on how to do that. But I know, like, if I see a 333, I know that's a 33 millihenry one. But that's, not because I can read the numbers, or that I, but I just I run across that value all the time. Yeah, yeah. But we're not going to go deal with that and stuff like that. But if you do need it, you know we do have the internet for, for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Trying to find out if you did end up getting a bag full of them and you need to find a particular one, you can go on the internet and take a look at. Yeah, it's not as straightforward as um, as resistors. But typically, you know, we have a bank full of resistors. We do have, you know, there we can have so many hundreds of resistors in a 
bin that we do need to know. If, you know, if you're pulling out of the bin, we want to take a look at, yep, that's the right value. Yeah. So there are different, uh, different types of inductions. Um, it's also, let's see here, I should have one. So sometimes if you see uh, another type of an inductor too is these um, ones that you see wrapped around the, your power cables or your, like the video cables. In fact, here's on one on my power cable. I have an inductor that's on my um, power cable. And basically it's just a big ferrite uh, ring that's going around my cable and it induces an inductance and what it does is it just eliminates the high frequencies going into my laptop. So those are, uh, so those eliminate the little high frequency noise that are uh, going into your devices and stuff like that. Just kind of a, just kind of a filter that actually we can just, doesn't even electrically connect to it. It just wraps around that wire and then it magnetically gets coupled with uh, any of the noise that's being transferred down through your your power cord, and it'll just kind of give us a very low X of L and kind of uh, eliminate any of those high frequencies that might be going into our laptop. So those are those little ferrite cords that you that you see that uh, bulging out of your uh, power cords. Uh, So inductors in series, again, if we, you know, if we, we already talked about it. inductors in series to add up like resistors in series. Inductors in parallel add like uh, uh, resistors in parallel. No, no real big uh thing there. So. All right, let's uh. So again, uh, when we're talking about um, an ideal inductor is going to have our reactive power. It's going to be, when I first apply power into it, the lines of magnetic lines are going to expand out. And then when my power gets shut off, it's going to put that energy back into the, back into the circuit again. If I didn't have the resistance of the windings, this inductor, just being in the circuit like I have here, would never generate any heat. I would never be able to feel it. But because of the resistance of the winding <coughs> that are in here, so like on a transformer, a transformer is kind of a big inductor. And it's got, uh, so it's got a bunch of windings on it, wrapped around a typically a laminated core. And if the ideal transformer wouldn't ever produce any heat. But since we have the resistance of the winding, we actually get true power, and that's where we're feeling that heat. Otherwise, an inductor or a transformer wouldn't produce any heat if it wasn't for that uh, resistance of the winding. And again, that's just unwanted heat that we don't want, but we can't uh, do anything about it. It's just part of the part of the circuit. All right, so current in an inductor then, we kind of talked about that. So basically, remember, when I first applied, so I'm not going to go to follow along. I'm on page 510, and then it's showing the circuit that they're using. But I'm 510 there is where this one here is. So basically, at time zero, I don't have any current. Then I, and then again, this is going to be, uh, This is a this is an RL circuit, so so I actually have a time constant, so I would have to have a circuit that so it would be an RL circuit. So I'd actually have to have an inductor and a resistor in here. And if I have an inductor and a resistor again, just like we did with our capacitors, I have actually a time constant. And our time constant 
is equal to uh, L over R, our inductance over our resistor. Remember, our time constant for the capacitor was T was equal to R times C. Okay? Just the opposite with, uh, with the inductor. This time, our time constant is, is our inductance over our resistance. And that gives us our time constant. So depending on what I have for a resistor and what the value of my inductor will determine how long it takes. And so when I first apply power to it, in the first time constant, that current is going to shoot up to 63% of its value of the total current. And then as we keep on giving it our five time constants, eventually I'm going to end up getting my total current. Now when we were looking at uh, when we were looking at our when we were looking at our capacitor, remember we were looking at it based on our voltage. After one time constant, the voltage went up to 63 percent, and then after five time constant, then it maintained it had all of its voltage across there. It acted like open and it had all the source voltage after five time constant. So with the capacitor, we were, we were looking at the voltage of the capacitor, and on the inductor, we're looking at the current of the inductor, what's happening with the in, current of the inductor. Okay, but on a capacitor, it's the voltage. After five time constants on a capacitor, it's fully charged to the maximum amount of voltage. On an inductor, after five time constants, it's gonna have its maximum amount of current. The voltage, the voltage across the inductor, if we did look at it, the voltage across the inductor would just be just the opposite. Okay? Once, that, once I got my maximum amount of current, my voltage across that inductor is going to be zero. At the beginning, it's going to be all the source voltage. The voltage is going to be all the source voltage at the beginning, and then goes down to down to zero. It's gonna act like a sh act like a short after five time constants. On uh, here it's you know my capacitor's gonna act like an open or act like my capacitor's gonna act like a short on my current on my capacitor and then it's just the opposite. My current is gonna start out very high and then go very low. So those two just get kind of flipped around. And this is an important part when we get into our LC service because we're going to see how these two are going to help each other or cancel each other out. One's going to be producing the voltage, and the other one's going to be whatever this voltage is that's being produced, that capacitor is going to absorb that energy. Then when my signal switches, that capacitor is going to put the energy back into it, and then go back into the inductor, and the inductor is going to induce the voltage again. It just kind of keeps on back back and forth and they're going to keep on adding and subtracting from each other. And then the two will end up actually canceling out when we're at a resonating frequency at a particular frequency. All right, any questions so far? Pretty straightforward. Should be starting to make a little bit more sense after we did chapter 10. I mean, this shouldn't be anything uh, other than the, the theory of how all this stuff works. Uh, let's see here. Um. Yeah, let's go, uh, let's go over this a bit. I don't think we had, uh, Let's go over this one real quick. So, um, so the instant that we close that switch, so I'm on, uh, I'm on page 512, so that's where I'm at. So the instant that we close that switch, remember that inductors, 
it's going to have a very high opposition to current. Okay, it's going to be inducing its it's going to be inducing its magnetic fields, and the polarity across that inductor is going to be such that it's going to be the opposite of the voltage source. So those are going to so those two voltages are going to cancel each other out, or the, the two currents are going to cancel each other out. So since this has a very high opposition to current, the voltage across that inductor is going to be dropping the source voltage. So at this instant, this voltage is going to be reading source voltage. It's going to be our 10 volts. Voltage across the resistor is going to be at 0 volts. Then after, then after time 10, uh, after one time constant, my current is going to start to go up into 63% of its total current. This inductor is it can, the, the lines of magnetic fluxes are going to start to expand and they're going to start to slow. They're not going to keep on expanding at a very fast rate. They're just going to start to slow out and they're starting to come to a to an end. And so the opposition to that current isn't going to be there anymore. And so the voltage across the inductor is going to start to drop, and the voltage across the resistor is going to start to increase. And then since I don't have as much opposition to current anymore. My current starts to increase. I'm going to start getting up to my 63% of my, my current. Then after two time constants, same thing, the lines of magnetic fluxes are starting to become stopped. My voltage across my inductors drops even more. My voltage across my resistor starts to increase. I still don't have nearly as much uh, opposition to current anymore. And so my current starts to increase to 86 percent. And if I just keep that going at 95 percent, my voltage is getting closer to zero. My voltage across the resistor is starting to get closer to my source. And then at uh, four time constants, I'm even getting even closer. And then at five time constants, about the maximum amount that I can never get to 99%, this voltage is going to be at its very lowest across the inductor. And then the voltage across the resistor is going to be at its very highest. And then now the inductor acts like a short, entirely even in the part of the circuit. The only thing I have in my circuit is that one resistor with one pillow. And I'm going to produce my. 10 milliamps of current or 99% of that total current that I can get out of there. Okay? So that's basically, just like I said, just basically just like a capacitor except just opposite. Yeah? All right. All right. Well, we take a quick uh, we'll take a quick ten minute break, and then we'll uh, we'll look at the response to a square.